Good morning. It's great to see everyone here this morning at Terry Third Thursday. Um, I'm Jill Walton, the Director of Alumni Relations at the Terry College, and we welcome you here to our Executive Education Center here in Atlanta, especially if it's your first time and you're here. This is Terry's home in Atlanta. We're proud of this facility, and we're glad that you all are here today. I'd like to begin this morning by recognizing our sponsors of Terry Third Thursday. They really make this event um, possible. And the Bank of North Georgia is our premier corporate sponsor. We have a few folks from Bank of North Georgia here today. Lisa Over, Kelly Green, Deborah Boyce, Drew Klepchik, Elizabeth Livingood, and Lauren Weathers. And they're right up here at the front. Thank you, Bank of North Georgia representatives. Our other sponsor is Deloitte. I don't think we have anyone here from um, Deloitte today, but we certainly appreciate, excuse me? Yeah, they're all recovering. <laughs> uh, right. They're all recovering, Harriet says. <laughs> um, we certainly appreciate Deloitte's support as well. Our two media sponsors are here today from the Atlanta Business Chronicle. We have Shelley Lewis and Tracy Oosterman. Thank you both for being here. And from Public Broadcasting Atlanta, Harriet Hoskins Abrahal. Harriet, would you like to make an announcement this morning? Good morning, everybody. Yes, please. <laughs> um, just a few notes on what's going on at uh, Atlanta Public Broadcasting. Um, on television, we are working with the Savannah College of Art and Design, who you probably know have purchased the mansion, which was a re restaurant, but originally one of the sort of founding houses of Atlanta owned by the Peters family and a very beautiful architectural piece it is or was it sort of fell into disrepair because it's not been doing anything for five years anyway we're going to put together a series um, on the renovation which will be shown on public television eventually so that's pretty exciting um, on the web uh, I might have mentioned this once before we have something called the Atlanta Forum Network it's in fact much bigger than that um, it is a group of, uh, shall we say, leading public radio stations that have got together around the country to record uh, speeches like the one we're about to hear, if you weren't doing it anyway, so, um, that people might not be able to get to. Uh, instead, we record them and video them and put them up on the web. and. Um, they're available to people in their offices and homes globally at any time they want to watch or listen. So if you have something in your uh, sphere of influence where, which you think might be of interest well beyond the people who actually attend such a lecture or talk, do let us know because we'd love to be there. It's, it's free for the first year because we're still kind of experimenting. It's pretty new. Um, and see me afterwards. Finally, Ira Glass uh, of a program called This American Life on Public Radio will be in town on the 29th of, of uh, April at the Atlanta Symphony Hall to talk about how to make radio. He's a laconic fellow and uh, an enjoyable person to listen to. Thanks. Thanks, Harriet. I wanted to let you know about um, a couple of the Terry Third Thursday upcoming speakers that we have. In May, Stephen Lamastra, who's the President and Chief Operating Officer of Raving Brands, will be our guest. If you don't know the name Raving Brands, you probably recognize some of their restaurant franchises, including Moe's Southwest Grill, Planet Smoothie, and Shane's Rib, Sh Rib Shack. So that's in May. And in June, we have Pete sennis Gali, who's the President and CEO of Manhattan Associates and he'll be here talking about managing a global supply chain. Later in the summer and fall in August, we have Maxine Clark, who is a UGA alum, and she is founder and chairman of Build-A-Bear Workshops. She'll be here. You might want to come for that. As she did on Oprah, she gave out bears uh, to all of the guests, so we're crossing our fingers. <laughs> um, we're looking forward also to September when we'll have Georgia basketball coach Dennis Felton. So we hope to see you at some of these upcoming events. You can always register online for Terry Third Thursday. Um, we also have season passes available that you can also do online. 
couple of alumni events coming up. We have a big weekend planned in Athens for our MBA alumni, our 2007 MBA reunion weekend. I know some of you here today have been a big part of planning that weekend and are planning to come over to Athens. We'll start tomorrow night with a reunion dinner. We have over 130 MBA alums and their guests signed up for that event. Saturday, the big event is a golf tournament that's hosted by the Graduate Business Association. Um, and it's going to be a, a great weekend full of lots of activities for our MBA alumni. The biggest Terry event of the year will occur on um, May 5th, right across the Lenox parking lot from here at the Weston Buckhead. It's our Alumni Awards and Gala, which is a fundraising event for the college, but also will recognize um, our Alumni Award recipients, including Bill Griffin, Jamie Reynolds, young alum Allison O'Kelly, and Mr. Earl Leonard. Um, We'll have live and silent auctions. We've got a lot of great items up for bid at that event. This event is hosted by the Terry College Alumni Board, and this board has just done a fabulous job um, with the event. So we, we thank the Alumni Board, and if you'd like more information about the event, you've got a postcard, a card there on your table. With more information, we'd love to see you there. One more quick announcement, I wanted to let you know that the Terry Evening MBA program um, will start offering classes right here at this center in Buckhead in August. The Evening MBA um, has been available in Gwinnett since 2000 and it's grown to almost um, 250 students. Um, the program will continue to be offered in Gwinnett. We'll have the second location here in Buckhead to allow us to grow even more and to make the program more accessible to, to more students. Um, you'll see the table tent on your table that, that goes into more detail about the Evening MBA program. And Chris Neelands is here today. Chris is over here. Chris is the marketing director for that program. And if you'd like to get more information about the, the Evening program in Gwinnett or Buckhead, you can see Chris today. Richard Quartz is going to come up and introduce our speaker today. Richard, a vice president at Carter. He's chair of our Terry Third Thursday Task Force on the Terry College Alumni Board. Um, he's a Terry grad from 1995. And at this time, I'm going to ask Richard to come on up and introduce our speaker. Thank you, Jill. Um, uh, this morning, it's my pleasure to introduce Taylor Glover, President, CEO, and CEO of Turner Enterprises. And when you say Turner in Atlanta, that's really only means one guy, Ted. Um, as President and CEO, Taylor has oversight of all Ted's uh, land holdings, financial interests, and uh, really just all his business interests in general, including Ted's Montana uh, Grill. Additionally, Taylor keeps a close eye on Turner's philanthropic and charitable organizations, uh, which include the UN Foundation, uh, the Nuclear Threat Initiative, and the Turner Foundation. Uh, he's also a board member, um, or on the board of directors of those organizations. Uh, Taylor also serves on the boards of Cox Enterprises, Cousins Property, Properties, and the Metro Atlanta Chamber of Commerce. Um, Taylor also has a couple charitable uh, and civic interests of his own. Um, we're happy to count the uh, Terry College as one of those. Um, he's currently chairman of the Terry College Board of Overseers. Additionally, he serves on the National Board of the Smithsonian Air and Space Museum. He's a huge pilot. Um, and some of his past board affiliations have included the Upper Chattahoochee River Keepers, the Nature Conservancy, the Georgia, uh, Nature Conservancy of Georgia, Presbyterian College, uh, the Westminster Schools, and the Ward Art Center. Um, Taylor was recently honored by the Atlanta City Council for his part in spearheading the effort to provide the Atlanta police officers with a uh, line of duty insurance policy. Um, his ag agree, or degree was in accounting, but uh, honestly, Taylor would rather talk to you about hunting, fishing, and flying, um, which are probably some of the topics we'll hear this morning. So let me welcome Taylor Glover. Well, you've stole my show. Thank you. And thank all of you for getting up at this somewhat ungodly hour. It's, uh, I was thinking on the way in, I, you know, I was advised no jokes, no, it's not, it's not my normal uh, way I would address a crowd. At the, the, because at this early hour, uh, I know many of y'all as I are just trying to wake up. So I'll, uh, I'm going to do the unusual and kind of stick to the script, but We'll open it up and 
you can fire away and I'll answer them as honestly as I can. Uh, it is truly an honor to be with you today. I, I, the one job I don't have at Turner Enterprises is public speaking. <laughs> Ted takes care of that. He's good at it and we carry a little shovel. When he gets in a little trouble, we try to clean it up the next morning. <laughs> I, you know, I, I really do uh, thank you for the opportunity to tell you what we do, because it, it, it's, it's pretty extraordinary what Ted's doing in, in quasi-retired life. Uh, Turner Enterprises is headquartered here in Atlanta, and we don't want any of you to confuse it with Turner Broadcasting, especially since they had that little incident with TNT at Logan Airport. But we, we, we haven't had any instances. We're, we, we, are, we, are, we were established actually to, to uh, uh, hold some of Ted's land holdings in, in, the, in the very beginning, but now we're pretty widely diversified and, and I'd like to tell you more about it. You know, Ted has been through some uh, dramatic changes in the last few years. Uh, every year, all of his life he goes through dramatic changes. <laughs> And, and, and I'm trying to figure out how to organize this story and, and tell it to you. And, I, you know, I've been there for a long, long time. Uh, when I say there, I've been his friend. I've been in, we've traveled a lot together for many, many years. And I think the best way for me to tell the story, in case I run out of time, is tell it backwards. You know, tell you where we are now and sort of how we got there. Um, for exactly five years, April 1st, I've served as president and CEO of Turner Enterprises. And our mission, and I'll read that to you, is to manage Turner assets in an economically, economically sustainable and ecologically sensitive manner. So this really needs update, but I mean, that is what we do every day. Uh, when, when Ted stepped out of his role at Time Warner, it was clear to me that he had plenty of energy left and he was not ready to retire in any form or fashion. And he had, he had asked me many times to join him, uh, even down at Turner Broadcasting. He, he, in the early days, he said, come down here, be my CFO. I really told him, I, you know, I never r really uh, passed the CPA test, done no accounting work since school. <laughs> thought that was a bad idea, but he didn't. He thought it was a great idea. <laughs> and so, you know, he, he approached me at the right stage in my life here five years ago because both of my children were grown and were going off to college. And as, as was mentioned, I had this expensive hobby of flying. And I knew anything to do with TED would involve travel and a lot of it. And so I thought maybe it'd subsidize some of my bad habits. But uh, he and I shared passions for outdoor life. I mean, we, that's what for 30 years I've been doing. We go hunting and fishing together. It's, it's, but you know, you don't, with TED, you don't eat a meal, you don't get in a boat fishing or in a stream without an intense business conversation. So it's, it's just on his mind from the time he wakes up to the time he goes to bed. And he's just, it, it's, it's exhausting. But it's, uh, <laughs> it, you know, it kind of gave me the chance. It, it, it said, you know, I have 29 properties. I can't be it but at one at a time. You don't have to buy anything. You use all my properties. You can do anything you want to. I mean, it, it, you, you name your price. I mean, it was just a, it was a dream come true. And so I, I, I said, you know, I'm going to take you up on it this time, and at least for five years. I signed my contract on April Fool's Day, just in case I wanted to get out of it. But <laughs> it's come and gone, and so uh, and I'm still there. I still go to work every day and, and enjoy it. Uh, before that, though, I'd been at Merrill Lynch for nearly 30 years, and I'd had a pretty good run there. And many of you helped me have that run there. So it it it, it it's remarkable what you learn in those years and how it might serve you later in life. Uh, at Merrill Lynch, there was a time that is different from today. They allowed me to run a venture capital fund. I mean, I, I was an early VC investor. I invested in a lot of real estate, invested in, in some real estate for Ted. I started doing transactions for him. It, it was just a different time, but, but the asset management roles and all the roles that, that I uh, uh, performed at Merrill Lynch prepared me for what I do now because we're involved in that and more. I'm still having to learn every day. Um, a, a lot of Turner Enterprises reminds me of what Turner Broadcasting was 30 years ago. It was a really small, spunky company that had a strong philosophical mission and, and it went on to change the world. I mean, CNN did, in my opinion, change the world, but Ted was putting Jacques Cousteau on and this was programming nobody else 
and management wanted to put on there because it wasn't making any money, but it was, it was what he believed in, and, and, it, and it was his passion. Um, he, he, he's charged everybody that works in my company with deploying all our energy and resources to finding innovative and uh, just workable solutions to some of the world's toughest problems. And, you know, he, he doesn't think small. These, these, these are monumental issues such as sustainable development, renewable energy, making the world more equitable and peaceful, and reducing the threat of nuclear weapon, weapons. And, you know, we might do all, touch on that everything, every bit of that in any one day. So it's just an average day at the office. I mean, it's like, it's like with, the, with the remote control. You just change and change and change it. He never, ever stops to enjoy the glory. If you give him an award, uh, he wins the America's Cup or something, what are we doing tomorrow? That was, that's, you know, that's done, we move on. Uh, but first of all, what do we really do on a day-to-day -day basis? Well, for, first, we got over two million acres of land, and that's a that's a lot of land to to manage responsibly. And it isn't all in one place. It's spread over 22 properties in 11 states, and so I get to enjoy my passion for flying because I visit those ranches every year, and we have ranch manager meetings, and, and we have some of the best people running those ranches. You just wouldn't believe it. Their backgrounds are unbelievable. I sit in a ranch manager meeting, and I say, God, these guys are really smart. I mean, they, they're the best of the best. It's, it's really, really fun. But any property owner, big or small, can tell you it's, it's really not easy being a responsible land steward. You've got to balance your own needs against those of your neighbors and the community as a whole. And how what I wanted to do when I got there, I mean, Ted was bleeding money. I mean, you need some more money, you just sold some time owner and or turn a broadcast or whatever it was at the time. You sold a big chunk, and when it ran out, you sold some more. And, 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 and I wanted to get down there and, and make this thing sustainable and say, so to me, it was how would, you know, how could we be responsible, sustainable, and earn a profit, or at least break even. I mean, you know, if you're having fun, breaking even isn't bad, but, 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 but you know, it, it, you can't. You want this thing to go on forever and ever. I mean, it's a it's 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 a, it's a real, real collection of properties. Um, so uh, we we've learned a lot about how to take care of land and to be a good neighbor. And one example of that is in every community in which we own property, we have a special allocation from the Turner Foundation that we give to the managers of those properties. And we say, go out in your community, find out what it needs. Does it need a softball field? Does it need a park upgrade? What does it need? And give it to them. And so I think we are viewed very suspiciously when we buy a property. And give us three or five years, and the community will support us and, and actually uh, give us accolades. So uh, it's, it's been fun. Uh, Ted was recently approached by a journalist uh, named Todd Wilkinson to to write a book on land management and stewardship practices. And so Todd's been traveling with us a lot lately to Argentina and other places and looking and seeing what we're doing. And it's going to be a fabulous book. And it's going to be a, it's, it's, it's going to be a textbook. And uh, um, I don't know it'll be that much fun to read. But, 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 but for those that really care about it, it, it it's, it's going to be a, you know, it'll be an authority. And I think that uh, a lot can be learned by it. And we look forward to publishing that soon. But our business is a fairly straightforward. I mean, our, one of our primary businesses, we raise bison and we sell them. And we selectively harvest natural resources such as trees in a manner that's, you know, that's the standard of responsible land stewardship. And, and we provide and sell unmatched sporting opportunities, recreational opportunities on our ranches. Ted can't be there all the time. So, it, you know, it's no fun to work on a place that you work to make it a show place. And nobody gets to see it. So we we uh, take guests, and we have a substantial guest operation. And we make sure from the minute we buy a ranch, I generally budget whatever we paid for it, or or southeastern property. I generally budget at least 30 percent to 50 percent. We're going to spend on improving it the day we buy it, and it may be take up every fence on the property, get rid of every piece of trash, get rid of every old building, we, we do it. We take it back to the most natural state that we possibly can do. Uh, additionally, many of you in this room probably know that Ted partnered uh, 
approximately five years ago, a little less than that, with, a, with a, an Atlanta restaurant to a George McCarrie to start Ted's Montana Grill. And, you know, the restaurant business is tough. And I remember when, when we decided to do this, I went up and sought advice from some of my, I mean, my briar patch was up on Wall Street, so I went to several of the an restaurant analysts. I remember going to one of the big Wall Street firms, had a top restaurant analyst, and it went in their office, and she closed the door, and I looked, and there was a sign up there, and it said, business is tough. And it said, the restaurant business is real, underlined, tough. <laughs> and, and I thought, what are we doing this for? You know, this is really going to be crazy. But I knew why we were doing it. I mean, the primary drive in starting the restaurant chain was to introduce people to bison. I mean, Ted had <clears throat> all these bison. They have babies, lots of them. And you got to keep buying land because they require lots of land. And, and, you know, it's just not sustainable. I mean, it, 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 it was the only way to do it. And, and, and the only way that I knew of that we were getting rid of bison meat is he sent it to me for Christmas. <laughs> and and I, I would take it out and put it on the grill, and, you know, the burger would fall through the grill, and it wouldn't stay together, and it was just too lean, and it, it just, you know... And he just always says, oh, it's great, it's great. Well, it was if his cook cooked it. I'm I don't know what she did, put butter in it or something, but it, it was terrific at his place, and, 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 and I never could make it. So we had to serve it. I mean, you just couldn't sell it. You had to serve it and, and introduce people to how you properly served it. Um, but we, we were up at that time. I mean, it, many of you know, bison roamed the plains by the millions. I mean, the millions. And they got down to just a few thousand. And so Ted was... Ted was in the 70s, uh, really uh, enthusiastic about bringing the species back. And uh, I remember 30 years ago when we went over to his uh, plantation in South Carolina, the first thing he did is put two bison on there. And they gored a horse and two. And it was, we learned the fences, and won't, certain fences won't hold them, and, and they don't like all the animals in, the, in there with them. But uh, uh, it, it, we now, that population of bison has gone back up to about a half a million in North America. Still, just a tiny, tiny amount, and we own about 10% of it. So it's uh, we're the biggest bison ranch by far, and 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 it and, and it has become a profitable business. Um, Ted liked them. He likes the way they look. Uh, he likes anybody that he's always pulling for the guy that's losing, and they were losing fast. I mean, they were being gunned down like nobody's business. And what he really liked about them, they were indigenous. And, and unlike cattle, they only eat what they need because they're, and they're really easier on the land. So they're, they, you know, they're, I mean, we basically only have perimeter fencing because our neighbors would like for us to have perimeter fencing. And, uh, and we do. But, uh, I mean, it, it's, it's really is cool to see them out just walk, walking across a 100,000 acre, you know, piece of property. And uh, it's just like it was in the West. I mean, you don't know where they're going to be in the morning. They move. I mean, you go over a hill and. By golly, there's 5,000 of them. I mean, it's, it's fun. Uh, bison is also an excellent product health-wise. And we use USDA information rather than our own. But the USDA says, and it said bison is lower in cholesterol and higher in protein than beef and less fattening than even skinless chicken. Well, I can tell you, it's pretty lean. And, and, but it, it tastes great. And if you haven't been to one of our grills, it's usually served properly there. I, I'd invite you to do it. Uh, Ted's done everything he can to encourage other ranchers to get in this business and to the tune of we've spent millions of dollars. I mean, advertising and going to uh, supporting bison co-ops that, that we, you know, we would send the bison to the co-op. It'd stay there three or four years in the freezer. Never got sold. Gave it to schools. They didn't want it. And one day they called up Ted and I remember that he said, we, you know, boss, we're going to, we found a way to distribute this bison. We're going to give it to the prisoners. Tested. My God, they'll never be customers, you know. He said, no, no, we're not giving it to prisoners. And so that's when we started Test Montana Grill. And, 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 and honestly, in, in typical turn of fashion, you know, we got to go too fast. I mean, really too fast, in my opinion. I warn him of this all the time. I mean, we're already up to nearly 50 restaurants. Uh, it's breakneck speed. You're hiring thousands of people. You just, you know, it's just, and, and not done in a fashion. That, that's easy to manage. I mean, we have, these 50 locations are spread over 18 states, from Colorado to South Florida to New York City, and everywhere you can imagine in between. And it's, you know, 
it, it, it's it's a tough the right the girl was right it's a tough business but we're going to we're getting it right and we're going to get it right and uh that's the beauty of ted if it takes five years it takes eight he said we lost money at cnn for five years and he did but it was the right thing to do uh primarily to the grills and the popularity for natural food and, and natural food grosses such as whole foods and even kroger starting to sell a lot of bison uh, wherever we put a restaurant. But the data from our, I mean, bison has skyrocketed. It's in tight and short supply. We'll be limited the number of restaurants we can build. In fact, we started off offering mostly bison entrees, and we had about 70% of our people buying bison, and they continued to buy, buy, order the bison entrees, even though we had chicken, fish. We started really menu diversification, trying to get away from bison, believe it or not, so that we can grow the chain. and and. We've, we've moved it down to 50 percent that's been maintained there. I mean, it's our people that come in there, they order it, they like it, and they continue to order it. Uh, you know, it is fun to be around somebody that, you know, not only is willing, but has the capacity to act on whatever he says. I mean, you know, that's why Ted's such a uh, interesting speaker to have. You don't know whether he's going to drop the bombshell, oh, this is a great place out. See, see Taylor tomorrow, I'll give you a million dollars or whatever. And so he's all, a lot more popular than I am. This is only my second speech in five years. <laughs> he does two a day, generally speaking. Uh, but what, today, there's really lots of talk about socially responsible, socially responsible businesses. And Ted's been acting that way for a long time. Uh, and, uh, and a lot of large companies are taking these social issues uh, very seriously, including. Uh, GE with their eco imagination, BP with Beyond Petroleum, and even earlier this week, I think Home Depot uh, announced Eco Options Program. Uh, Walmart and others are doing tremendous work in these areas now. But as back when Ted said I was doing cable when cable wasn't cool, we were doing this from the day I met him. I mean, we've always been running. All the businesses, whether we, we strive to make a profit, but first we run them in a responsible manner. If we don't make a profit, we keep working at it. Whether it's CNN, TEI, or Test Montana Grill, there's a compelling social mission to everything. It underpins everything we do. Um, it makes it a fun place to work. I mean, you, you feel good about what you're doing, and, and I, I certainly have enjoyed it. And, and Ted is not one just to to, to you know, he he walks the talk. He's he, he's he's not a limousine liberal. I mean, a limousine shows up. Ted wants a van, or I mean, he wants a hybrid. I mean, New York, he won't ride unless they pick him up in a Prius or something like that. He'll walk, and he and he's a he's a he is a huge walker. But one of the properties that he and I have been visiting for over 20 years, I, I talked him into buying a place, and I said, get down around Thomasville. It's really good quail hunting. Nah, I don't want to be there. And, Anyway, he, he, he wound up visiting with a friend and then buying the friend's place. So we, we've had a place for about 20 years. And uh, on that one property, he has planted, and longleaf pines, for those of you that don't know, they take about seven years before you even see anything. So it's a very long-term project and, not, and, and a large reason that most people don't plant them. Well, we planted over a million, which is, which is a tremendous amount. And, and, and we, when I talk about sustainable, uh, forestry. We only take out the diseased or the cat-faced or the you know the, the trees that are that that, that are uh, detracting or or might be diseased is is what we harvest. But uh, um, all these th th these million pines, I see them now. We're hunting that property now, and it's uh, some of it at any rate, and it's it's become great habitat for quail, and for this he's uh, turned endangered species fund has been a proponent of bringing back this red cockyated woodpecker and. It ain't easy, but they, 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 they go in these tall, long-leaf pines, and they put them in a little tree house in there and camouflage it, and they're flourishing. There are plenty of them down there now, and it's, 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 it's a species that was, well, still is endangered, but it's certainly very low population. It's fun to see them. But really, you know, people criticize many wealthy people living in big houses, and they say, well, I'm buying carbon offsets. We don't buy any carbon offsets, but we, we really produce carbon offsets. Just to give you some magnitude of that one property, it's 30,000 acres, is, uh, and that will sequester about 2.25 million um, 
tons of carbon, which is the equivalent of 300,000 automobiles driving around in a year in the United States. So it's, you know, I, I think when they balance it off, Ted will be, his side of the ledger will look really, really good. And that's just one property. We've got another property that's 600,000 acres, and it has, it's mostly timber. It's out west, but we don't, you know, we, it's too, too hard to calculate all these things. But that gives you an example of what I, what I think is going on and the way he thinks. And, and, and you might think, well, that's typical Turner, tree hugger, environmentalist. Of course he'd do that. And, and, and what you might not realize, and certainly since I've been there, uh, this land management is profit driven. I'm the for profit guy, and we got plenty of not for profit guys that spend this stuff, but uh, <laughs> they have to report back up through me too, so I get a little bit of a, I get a shot at them. But pristine and diverse environments also provide excellent sporting opportunities, excellent fishing, excellent hunting, and outfitting is one of our principal revenue sources in addition to our bison. In fact, we typically charge way more for our hunts than, than, the, than any others who do this because we limit them and your experience will be the same experience that Ted and I get on these ranches. I mean, it's, in fact, Ted and I don't hunt anymore uh, uh, big game at all, so you can have it all. And, uh, uh, and, and, and we at one ranch in New Mexico, I was just telling somebody earlier this morning, we have hunters that are paying us $15,000 to hunt an elk, and we sell 200 of those. That's $3 million. And we also have fishing on that ranch. We have a couple of million dollars worth of fishing income on that ranch. And so we have natural resource income. I mean, it, it, the, the ranches are profitable. I mean, I, that first time, I mean this was maybe been the first year, or maybe last, last year, I think, was the first year. Is that right, David? Last year was the first year, but, 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 but in five years, we brought them to, to, to profitability. And, 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 you know, there's, you never have to sell if you're running a profit. You just, you know, take them and buy some more land. And uh, Ted had the foresight, and I remember talking with uh, great Georgia alum Tom Cousins, hunting on one of his plantations, where Ted pointed out there's a 700-acre field here. Why don't... Why don't you plant it in trees like I'm doing? Tom said, oh, I'm old, and it'll take a long time for those trees to grow. And, and uh, he said, besides that, we get a little rent on the, from the farmers on that field. It had a big center pivot irrigation. He said, so, Tom, what does ag land sell for down here? And at the time, maybe it sold three or $400 an acre, maybe less. He said, what does quail land sell for? It's a couple of thousand. He said, well, it's a no-brainer. Plant it in trees. We'll be hunting. And we are hunting now. And it's... Uh, Tremendous hunting, and, 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 you know, the trees are valuable, too. I mean, it's not like there isn't value in the trees, but, it, but, but the most important thing is th these properties sell for a lot more if they're pristine. Um, we've seen out west recreational properties that we bought as ag properties that turn into recreational properties, and now people, are, you know, are paying five times the price for, for, for recreational properties as they'll pay for agricultural properties. But, uh, but looking 20 years down the road and applying, you know, by looking 20 years down the road and applying strict principles to land management, we've turned one of the most poor industries and, and volatile industries, ranching. I mean, no rich rancher. It's only because he sold his land. Uh, but but, but we, we've, we've turned them into consistent money-making businesses. And all the while, uh, maintaining large tracts of land in their natural state and, and preserving these are vast ecosystems and, and, and you know the only other I mean the only real people that are doing this are the National Park Service and and, and the Nature Conservancy and Nature Conservancy we, we get we're I think we're still the single largest donor of easements on our land to the Nature Conservancy. I'd have to check that that, may, that data may be two years old. But but we're large. Uh, and, and let's spend a minute on what's next, what's going on right now. And uh, one new investment opportunity that I'm particularly excited about is alternative energy. And, and really, three or four years ago, Ted said, you know, let's get out there, let's, let's, let's get in this business. We've got lots of land, let's get into wind power. And so we went and we studied wind power, went down to Florida Power and Light, who's the largest developer of wind power, talked about maybe having a partnership. And they've been gathering data, wind data, on all of our properties for 18 months or so. so Jury's out. I don't think with today's technology we'll have a, a spectacular site to do that, but never know. Technology's changing, and uh, 
but we were able to make an investment recently into a solar company, which I'm really excited about. And uh, Ted, Ted asked for a kind of a study on what the landscape looked like for other investment opportunities. We came up with a solar company, and he and I invested in DT Solar, which was a private company in New Jersey. And DT Solar designs and installs commercial scale solar systems that enable its customers to utilize renewable energy and save money on their power bills. The company is, is undergoing a change right now to name change to Turner Renewables. And it's in a, as you might imagine, it's also um, undergoing some rapid growth plans. We, we're expanding. We have, uh, we're not, we're, our investment money still warm there. It hadn't been, we haven't been invested in more than six months. We've already doubled the, more than doubled the employees. We're opening, we have opened an, uh, an office in Texas. We are opening or have opened an office in California. We have hired and staffed both of those offices. And, you know, this should be triple digit type growth for, for the next few years anyway. Um, we, we're excited, and I, I particularly and Ted are excited about the prospects for solar energy because it's really the best way for large corporations to take action in renewables today. I mean, it's spotty. It's, it's only in certain states. But it, it, it's, you know, putting a rooftop solar power system on a bu building is an excellent way to displace fossil fuel-based energy sources and, believe it or not, save money, especially, I believe, that in the long run. With the cost coming down for the solar materials, we see this business as a huge opportunity and to, you know, a huge opportunity for us to increase the use of renewable energy and, again, profit along the way. Combined, th th this next statistic may surprise some of you, surprise me. Combined, the entities that, uh, that Ted has spawned uh, or, or acquired lands and so forth, we employ nearly 3,000 people. Staggering. I, mean, it's, I don't even know that CNN employs that many today. I, I'd have to look. I mean, when we left. That was about turn of broadcasting size, and um, you know that that covers everything from ranches to restaurants to to philanthropies. But uh, it, it's 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 a lot of jobs and a lot of job creation, and we're going to continue. I, I suspect we'll hire over a thousand people this year. I know we will. Um, switching gears from the for-profit to the not-for-profit. Uh, Ted is one of the most innovative philanthropists, and the Turner Philanthropies are an integral part of what we do. Since 1990, uh, the philanthropies have invested over a billion dollars in various causes. Um, two of these philanthropies, the Turner Foundation and the Turner Endangered Species Fund, focus on a micro level at the Turner Properties and at a macro level on the environment. The United Nations Foundation and the Nuclear Threat Initiative work globally, tackling the world's most pressing issues, reducing the threat of weapons of mass destruction, destruction and creating a more equitable and peaceful world. That's hard money to raise to, to do those types of things. And, 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 and so that's why he wants to dedicate the lion's share of his money to those type of efforts. Uh, we're able to manage these different but overlapping interests because Ted has an unmatched knack for attracting people that are truly world class at their jobs and their field. For example, in 2001, we created the Nuclear Threat Initiative. And we recruited to head that up Georgia Senator Sam Nunn, who I know many of you here are familiar with in this room. He's arguably the most seasoned security expert in the world. And two weeks ago, or three weeks ago, the New York Times Sunday Magazine section had a picture of Sam on the front. And it said, what keeps this man up at night? What, what, what worries him? But I wanna, I'm going to read to you just one excerpt out of the New York Times article. And I'd be glad to supply it to anybody that wants it. It's a terrific article. Quote, a decade after leaving the United States Senate, where he spent years as chairman of the Armed Services Committee, None pose one overriding question about his list of things we'll, we will wish we had done if a doomsday should ever come. Why aren't we doing them now, was his quote. 
in a sense, his own, unanswer his own answer has been to help found and run the Nuclear Threat Initiative, a Washington-based foundation largely bankrolled by Nunn's friends, Ted Turner and Warren Buffett. Initially, I'm digressing from the quote, initially Ted thought of this idea, funded it for $250 million. And Warren, and stocks went down, money got tight, Warren came in, saw the importance of this, and, and, and really uh, has made a significant contribution to Nuclear Threat Initiative. But in what might be the most ambitious example of private dollars subsidizing national security, the Nuclear Threat Initiative is trying to fill in the gaps where government is failing to reduce nuclear threats. In other words, do the things now that we would otherwise wish we had done. And I can tell you, I've worked very, very close with Sam, and uh, we've traveled the world together, and uh, he's the man for the job. He is terrific, and his board, which he largely recruited, uh, I go to all the board meetings, and it's, it's just, I mean, he's, he's got leading Russians, he's got Senator Luger, which he offered the, authored the non-Luger bill when he was in the Senate, Pete Domenici, who's a Republican from New Mexico senator, and the list is just incredible of the of the uh, uh, people that serve on that board. Another has become a friend of mine, Amarta Sin, who was uh, who won the Nobel Prize for for economics, is on that board, and uh, it just you know it's it's full of energy sitting around listening to these people debate big issues, uh, especially the Russians and hearing their side of their side of things. NTI uh, worked closely with Mohamed El Barde. And, uh, El Barde is the Director General of the International Atomic Energy Agency. Uh, NTI worked with him to upgrade the monitoring of nuclear material worldwide and to create an international nu nuclear fuel bank. I can tell you on two separate trips, Sam and I, well, the board went to Kazakhstan where we funded a nuclear blend down facility. That was quite an interesting tour. And then uh, I went on this trip with Sam two years ago to, to propose a nuclear fuel bank reserve uh, to El Barde, the head of the IAEA. And we were, going to, we were proposing this like a strategic petroleum oil reserve for the globe. And it would be administered by the IAEA. So if we get mad at Iran, we can't stop their fuel supply. They, and this removes the fig leaf of them saying, we're building nuclear power plants, we need a reactor. Because once you build a reactor, you can make bomb grade, weapon grade material. So you wouldn't want to have, I mean, it's a legitimate, it's legitimate that if your power source needs nuclear fuel, you, want to be, you don't want to be self-sufficient in it. You know? That's a very dangerous world, in Sam's opinion, and we need to, uh, do something about that. And so the IEA is the right agency to administer that, and they were going to assure any member or any country uh, a fuel supply for many, many years. And it was very, very expensive, and that's where we bought Warren in, and he, he was a big benefactor with that. Um, you know, partially due to these efforts, I believe El Barde, I believe that was part of the reason El Barde won the Nobel Peace Prize in 2005. In 1997, when we created the United Nations Foundation with Ted's billion dollar pledge, which, uh, by the way, has been, com it has been completely funded, um, we enlisted Tim Worth, who was a former senator from Colorado, and he was also the Under Secretary for State of Global Affairs to serve as president, and he's Seven years later, seven or eight years later, he's still serving as president. They got a terrific board. I was at their board meeting two days ago. Uh, one of the ladies, uh, it's interesting, all, most all these boards, uh, Ted has a philosophy that we men have screwed the world up for the last hundred years. It's time to give the women a chance. And so most of these boards are predominantly women. And he's, he's, uh, he, he believes in it. And one of, one of the women on this board is Gracia Michelle. And she's an interesting lady. She's uh, the, the wife of Nelson Mandela, and she's the only living woman to serve as first lady of two different countries, uh, South Africa and Mozambique. And also on that board, and been there since the beginning, is a guy that I really like named Mohammed Yunus. And Yunus founded the 
Grameen Bank, which was microcredit, and he received the 2006 Nobel Peace Prize. So there's some talent on these boards that just, I mean, Andy Young serves on that board. In addition, we've got leading representatives from India, Pakistan, Africa, Russia, to name a few. And uh, they all have a different view. And it's, uh, these board meetings usually last two days and uh, with dinners and lunches and go right through. I mean, it, it, it's, they're intense and uh, I learn a lot from them. The president of the Turner Foundation is Mike Finley. He's located right here in town. Mike came out of a 30-year career with the U.S. Park Service where he has served as superintendent of Yellowstone, Yosemite, the Everglades, and Glacier National. So, I mean, you just don't get people like this. I mean, they aren't available. I mean, when they retire, it's our, our biggest ranch manager just retired. Man, we looked everywhere. And I, I, I came back to Ted and I said, you know, there's only one place for us to, there's only one place for us to find the right replacement, and that's from right within our own company. We got them. Take our second biggest ranch manager, move him, move everybody up. I mean, it's time. We can, find, we can replace the smallest ranch manager, but we, this guy was virtually irreplaceable at Vermejo. And it, it really gave our guys a career path. I mean, they think they're on, on that ranch. They're going to be on that ranch forever. They're going to die on that ranch. And their family, and, and, and they hate to leave, but you got to give them the opportunity. And uh, so far, everybody's answered the call. <sighs> you know, despite... Because in, in, in the incredible supporting cast, Ted is still moving as fast as he can to achieve everything he can in his lifetime. And it's, with the grills, you know, I said, Ted, we need to slow down. I'm 67. That's last year. I'm 67. You're young. You can slow down, but I can't. And so he's still flying over 500 hours. He zips around the world giving speeches. I mean, he'll, he'll do morning in L.A., lunch, at, you know, uh, somewhere on the way, and then New York at night. And he, he just sleeps on that plane most of the time. And uh, uh, he creates strategic partnerships as well as doing speeches, both for profit and philanthropic. Sometimes they overlap. And he looks past the horizon and he sees things that, that most of us just don't see. And, uh, you know, after all, this is a man that won the America's Cup, the World Series, created the Goodwill Games, CNN, TBS, TNT, Cartoon Network, and was named Time Man of the Year, and he's still, he's still charging as hard as he ever was. So, that brings me to, how, you know, how, how did I come to know Ted? Well, I met him the way a lot of people do. I asked him for some money for a charity, <laughs> and it goes way back. It's 30 years ago, and uh, the year was 1978, and uh, the cause that I decided to was important to me and that uh, I wanted to work with was an organization named Ducks Unlimited. And my rationale was that both Ted and DU would benefit from my exposing them to each other. And uh, it started with a spirited debate, which I can tell you we continue daily. I turned my phone off because it rings every morning at 8.30 and we usually have an early morning debate, but not 7, 8, 8.30. And, uh, I, you know, I've got a recommendation for this, uh, this uh, Terry Third Thursday. I think you should have an evening edition. I could spice this up a lot more. <laughs> 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 but in any event, uh, the conversation went something like this. First off, Ted always speaks on a speakerphone, and I don't think he can dial. I mean, somebody gets here on the phone, and he's, ah, da, da, da. you know, it's, it's just, he's there. And so he's, he gets on the phone, he goes, hey, pal. And I say, hello, Mr. Turner. No, call me Ted. Just call me Ted. It's, he hates Mr. Turner. And so to this day, I call him Ted. And I, I tell him I'm calling him on behalf of DU. Well, in typical Turner fashion, he tells me more about DU than I know. Lots more. I know him all about it. It's a great organization. I'll do whatever, you, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm a supporter. I'm, I'm enthusiastic. I said, well, great. What we, you just bought the Atlanta Hawks. And uh, what I'd like you to do is give us two tickets to raffle off uh, to next year's Hawks season. He said, great, no problem. What game do you want? And I thought, well, he really doesn't know much about basketball. <laughs> what game do I want? These are season tickets, you know, all of them. And, and, <laughs> and he says, no, no way. I'm not giving you that much. These, you know, these things cost them at seven hundred dollars. I give you what, you know, whatever game you want, take it or leave it. And now, I'm desperate, and I'm a little irritated. 
and uh, which also continues to this day. I work in <laughs> desperation, and I work a little irritated. Uh, but the conversation continued, and I explained why this would be good for him. And I said, you know, you got to, we, he, he called it himself, the empty Omni, the first game he went to. He looked around, there's nobody there. And, and you know, I think they had a couple of thousand season tickets sold out of 13,000. I said, you know, put somebody in the stands. And uh, he's, he, still, he comes back, he says, no, no, they cost $700. I'm not giving you that much. I said, Ted, they won't bring half that much at a charity auction of people that have been drinking. It just, it, <laughs> and yeah, they went, and we're going back and forth. And I said, well, and if they do, I'll buy four of the best tickets you got in the house. And he didn't bat an eye. He says, okay, you got yourself a deal. He said, I'll bid 351 and D, this guy wants to buy four of those tickets we're putting on the floor. They're really expensive tickets, too. And, uh, and, and, and so I'm really beside myself now. I said, hmm, I don't want to buy four tickets. And I said, no, no, no. You have to be present to bid. He said, when is it? I told him. He said, D, can I make it? She said, you can he said, I'll be there. I said, oh, my goodness. So I saved him a place at my table. He came. He just returned from uh, the baseball draft, where he, has, he had his eyes on Reggie Jackson and a few others, but his pocketbook didn't match. He hadn't won anything. Uh, he came that night ready to bid and ready to win, and he had the capacity to do both. Uh, and toward the end of the evening, a trip was auctioned by Rankin Smith, who owned the Falcons, and it went for a $7,000, as I remember, to Seminole Plantation to hunt. Ted said, I just bought a plantation. I could have done that. I said, Ted, it's your lucky day. I'm in charge here. You know, you still can. So I went up there and stuttered and stammered, tried to tell him about it. He came up, gave me the hook, and he really, really came on strong, and, and it raised $10,000. And then in typical turn of fashion, I mean, he eats and goes to bed. And, uh, uh, you know, he came in, stole the show, and he left early asking me if I could deliver all the stuff he had bought to his office because I arranged delivery the next day. And this included live dogs, and <laughs> guns, boats. I mean, you name it. He bought everything. And, and I had a massive headache the next morning. And the live dogs that I had taken home that were so cute and cuddly and didn't look like they were going to cause any trouble, I fixed them a bowl of water and a bowl of cereal because I didn't have any dog food. And, uh, <laughs> When I got up the next morning, they were yipping and hollering. I went in there, and they turned everything over. They'd gone to the bathroom everywhere, and it was a wreck. And I, 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 uh, I, I packed it all up, ready to get rid of it, and drove to his office. And, you know, he asked me then and there. We, we, we had a short conversation. We had a good time the night before. He said, look, do you know who bought that auction? And I said, no. He said, well, he said, how about going over there and helping me with it? And I said, I will. And so I got to go on my first hunting trip with him to Hope Plantation. We became instant friends. I think I went back the very next weekend, and we've been at it for 30 years. So it's been a good partnership for both of us. Um, I, I'll open for questions, and I'll tell you, you know, if I don't answer them, we got a wonderful website, www.tedturner.com, and we're writing a book. And the, the working title is Call Me Ted. So it <laughs> should be in your bookstores next year in time for Christmas. What can I answer? Anything? All right. Any questions? You got one right out of the bat. That's not, but I hope that's not a loaded one. Because we're I know that guy. Yeah. <laughs> My question uh, for those that have been to Ted's Montana Grill, you've probably flipped the second page and seen the plethora of burger choices that you have. I've got my favorite. I'd like to know what Ted's favorite is and what your favorite is and what's the most popular. Well, that's three questions. Uh, <laughs> the easy question for me would be what is my favorite? My favorite you know, is a bacon cheeseburger. And so that probably takes a lot of that calorie content and throw, throws it up. But, but uh, Ted is a, he's a, uh, has a tremendous appetite. Uh, he burns it off, but he has a tremendous appetite. And he, he gets, generally gets that mushroom Swiss burger and, Sometimes he has them put some bacon on there too, and he'll he'll order it with. Um, they usually bring either French fries, onion rings. He has them split the order, and uh, and then he'll always have a cup of chili. And it's Karen's Karen is the cook that a lot of this stuff is that we got the recipes from. She is, she she works at the Flying D. She's a was a yoga instructor, and she is uh, in terrific shape and and eats and, and cooks um, terrifically healthy food. I mean Ted's in great 
help. I mean, he didn't have an ounce of fat. He wears the same clothes he wore in college. He's, he's exactly the same size. So um, that's, the, and, and, and as for what's most popular, I don't know. I, I, I don't. I mean, it's, what, it's a cheeseburger, cheeseburger, and uh, as you would think. But the, uh, the, the, the menu has changed. I hadn't had a burger there in a long time. I get the burger patty put on a salad sometimes, they eat chicken, salmon. The, the fish is terrific there. I mean, I, I've started eating trout and uh, steaks are terrific. So no more advertisements. I, I'm, I, I mean, I get to, Ted will eat. If he's in town, Ted will eat 11 or 12 straight meals at Tess Montana Grill. I mean, he doesn't go anywhere else. And, and he doesn't get any other news source other than CNN to this day. I mean, I have gotten to where I detest the early mornings because it's always CNN, and he's always exercising, making lots of, ooh, ooh, you know, I'm trying to sleep. And, uh, and we go to Ted's Montana Grill every time. I said, Ted, we need to see the competition. So I'm the guy that eats out every meal. And uh, so I'm... I, you know, I have a few other favorite restaurants, but it, but 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 I, I I I eat my share at TMG. Yeah, back. Good morning. Uh, I've got a question with Ted's ability to create markets and create uh, entire structures within organization and society. You mentioned the chlorofluorocarbon, the chlorofluorocarbon, carbon, excuse me, credit that the some of the properties are generating. Yes. Stiglitz's book on globalization talks about encouraging Amazon countries with rainforests to maintain those. That there's some economic incentive. Does he have any eye towards trying to create some type of like transfer development rights with within that industry where you have credits based on maintaining green space? Mm -hmm. to keep that as an economic incentive because you said if it's profitable, you don't deforest. If it's profitable, you maintain a ranch. If it's not, you seek alternative means for that uh, land. Right. It, that's, a, that's a great question and, and one that, that you know, I, I could go back and really give you uh, uh, some, some statistics that would uh, uh, back up what I'm about to say. But uh, in the last two weeks, one at the United Nations Foundation and one we went to uh, uh, CSIS, Chair, Sam's the chairman of the board of the Center for Strategic International Studies. And we talked about just what you're talking about. And uh, it was shocking to me to learn what an acre of rainforest deforested does. Uh, and, and I can't give you the statistics, but it was overwhelming. Uh, the clearing of the rainforest is far more damage than all the cars in America. Just what they're clearing on an annual basis. Far more. I mean, it, it sequesters far more carbon than what we're putting in the atmosphere. It's shocking. Uh, as for a car carbon trading uh, system, is that was that part of your question? Yeah. We're very interested. We have hired. We have a consultant that uh, found us our solar company, and we ask him, how do we promote that? It's voluntarily. It's only volunteer in this country right now. It, I don't think it will be volunteer. I believe there's going to be a carbon tax. And I believe then fossil fuels will be as expensive or more expensive than fossil fuels. If you, if, you know, this Supreme Court ruling last week that is going to allow the states to really uh, go after polluters uh, is it, it, going to move us into a uh, carbon reduction society. I don't know what form it's going to take. But it's going to take some form, and I believe carbon trading is a, is, a, is a wonderful opportunity, and that we ought to be exploring it, and we are. I don't have the answer yet. Next year, take us, take us three years to figure out when would work for us right now. But it took us a year to find solar. I, I don't know. I mean, there's so much money crowding into this space right now. It's like you know, it's like we've come to the party late, but I don't think we really are. Uh, Sure, there's some valuations out there that I don't want to pay for companies, and believe me, we didn't pay that for our solar company. I mean, we bought it at a much less multiple because we explained to them what we we're going to bring. We're going to bring unlimited resources. We're going to back you. We don't, you know, we we like the fact you're already profitable, but we want you to go unprofitable for a couple of years because we want you to expand, and we're with you. And uh, anything else I should add to that, David? Yeah. 
Yeah, we, just, we are looking into it, and we, we have a person that we have hired and engaged to do that. And we, think, we think a lot of, of his uh, expertise in this area. Yeah. Two? Yeah. I don't know that's on, but go, speak up. <laughs> um, my question is, just talking to people in the business world, everyone's complaining about how everything goes to China. Yeah. And then I read an article about if we took the value of the cost of what they're doing to the environment and potentially the people that they really haven't, they're not profitable no. because of the cost. Do you see in the next, and not even with your company, just your idea, do you see America and more developed countries taking back industry on this cleaner level? Do you think we have a chance? I believe we do, but I wanted to get your opinion of Bologna, Italy is a good example. They produce a lot of nice products that are very distinct. Can America have that position again to where we take it back? It's, our, it's one of our only hopes. Uh, I'm going to comment in just a minute on China. Again, I'm, I get the big picture, but if I've got to give it to you in, 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 in proper statistics, I've got to have somebody like my brain over here, David Withers, go back and research them up get them for me. But Ch China is heavily polluted. People that go there, Sam told me recently he went there and he could not even go out for a walk. He could not see the hotel two blocks away. It's, he said his throat burned. Uh, no, you can't, you can't continue that. But, as I understand it, Central administration is saying we're going to clean it up, but they, they're building one coal plant a day in China, and this is really dirty coal. The governors of the provinces are, if that's what they're called, and I believe it is, are, are not enforcing because they either got people in the workplace or they don't, and the workers win. So there is an article that I like to refer you to, maybe the best article I've read this year written by an author that I really admire, Thomas Friedman, who wrote The World is Flat. Again, this was in the New York Times, last week, magazine section. Uh, I've ordered many, many copies. <laughs> I gave a copy to Ted, they, was it Monday? Monday? Monday at lunch, I saw Ted. He had a minor operation, so he's a little late. I gave him this copy and I said, Ted, this is the best article I've read. It's on China and what we have to do we're going to have to live with China, and we're going to have to we're going to have to get down to the China level on pricing. I mean, it, it, hard as this going to sounds like it's going to be, but it, it's really worth reading. It's by Friedman, and it's in the same. I gave it to Ted at lunch, and at five o'clock we had a meeting. He came and he says, "I just sent you the most incredible article I've ever read." I said, well, yeah, "Granted, he had had an operation, he had anesthesia that morning." <laughs> I said, man, you don't get any credit around here for anything. I mean, it's, it, I encourage you to read that article. I think it'll address a lot of your concerns. And uh, I hope I can stop there because I can't really articulate it nearly as well as Friedman did. Yes? I have a question regarding um, Iran. It's kind of obvious what's unfolding there and the number of centrifuges and things that are going on. We can't have an opinion. I mean, we're watching this kind of scenario unfold and nobody's doing anything. Yeah. All right. I, I hate it that this is being taped, but um, I'd love to just answer that straight up, and I probably will anyway. But uh, Ted and, nu and the Nuclear Threat Initiative are not far apart, but, they're f but they are far apart on this issue. And so Sam, I helped negotiate Sam coming to run our Nuclear Threat Initiative, and he held the position. This would be more than you asked for, but I'm going to tell it to you. He held the position that we need to reduce... Uh, global material everywhere. But he also held the belief, unlike Ted, that we couldn't, you know, we shouldn't say no nuclear. And Ted is no nuclear. And so we had to get them to bridge this gap. And Ted, and Sam correctly said, I believe, you got to work the center. You work the left or the right, whatever you spend on 
the left, the right's going to spend more, and you got to work that center position, so we can't go that strong. But I'm, I'm going to get to Iran, but in any event, Ted's belief is we ought to have no nuclear weapons, period. Uh, it's, 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 it seems to be an impossible sale, but uh, that's, that, that's what his goal and his desire is. And as for Iran, and this is, is something that he might say, and uh, is it, why not? You know, we're not, we're not living up to the treaty, the non-proliferation treaty. We're not reducing our nuclear arsenal. So he, he's, he's, he looks at it in a kind of a twisted way. I mean, he always, he's a debater. He always takes the other side. And, and you know, he, I mean, these are the kind of things Ted called me one day and says, hey, I want my own nuclear bomb. So <laughs> if they got them, you has got them, why not me? I said, well, you have to be a state. He said, I am a state. I'm a state of confusion. <laughs> now, how do you argue with people like this? But in any event, I've kept him from stating his opinion quite so boldly, and then I come out and do it. But, uh, uh, you know, Iran is a worry, is a, is a, is a, is a big worry. If I, we talk to Sam, what's, what's already developing? Now that they said, we're going we're gonna, to we're gonna build a reactor. Nobody trusts them. Nobody believes they're not going to. They're going to use it, that they're only going to use it for peaceful purposes. So who else wants one now? Syria? Everybody over there wants one. It's going to, you know, this non-proliferation treaty was signed, and I can't remember the date, but it's, it, it goes back, and that there were, the, the nuclear states would reduce their nuclear materials, and that no other states would be allowed nuclear status. Some gave up their nuclear status, like Kazakhstan, part of Russia. And, you know, you've got North Korea and Iran thumbing their nose and we're going for it. And they won't be the only ones. I'm telling you, it's a club. People want to be in it. And, and you know what? We listen to that little guy in North Korea because, we're, because he's doing what he's doing. I don't think he'd get much attention if he, if he weren't doing what he's doing. That's sad. And, uh, Pardon? We're reinforced, reinforced. The world is. Yeah, I, I, you know, uh, again, I wish I had my supporting cast with me. I put Sam up here and he'd give you an hour on it. And, 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 but we believe it's a problem. And that is exactly why we try to set up this fuel reserve to say, if you, it's right for you to have nuclear power. We, we, I mean, even Ted has come around on, now that global warming seems such a reality. He's come around and said nuclear's got to be part of the solution. And so if it's got to be part of the solution, you've got, you got to be assured of supply. And we think that that IAEA solution is the best solution. That answer, I hope it answers your question. Oh, yes. Hi, right, thanks for coming. Uh, my name's Adam Nearing, and uh, I just wanted to ask a question about the ranching operations, kind of steer back away from some the of these more global issues. issues. Okay. Uh, you know, I think a lot of us have heard about the ranches that Ted has, and um, his passion for that. And this is, it was really interesting to hear about how things tie in with the restaurants. And I'm curious as to the more recreation portion of the business and what you're doing to, for your marketing strategy. I, I really hadn't heard much about the opportunity to do some of the hunting on the ranches. So I think that's really inter interesting. And I thought it'd be good to hear some of the strategy to. I, that, that's a question I'd, I'd love to address because I can tell you that the, the large share of our hunting and fishing revenues comes from one enormous ranch, which is the Vermejo Ranch. It's 600,000 acres. It's three times as big as the inside of the perimeter of Atlanta. It's third the size of Rhode Island. It's, it's, it's a big ranch. Uh, we bought it from Pennzoil. Pennzoil ran a hunting operation there, a fine, a fine hunting operation, uh, I might add. Uh, it was immediately rumored. It's in Raytown, New Mexico. There's not much of an employment base there. It was immediately rumored that Ted would shut down all hunting and use it for himself. Why do we need the hunting and fishing income? Ted goes there once a year to hunt a turkey. That's it. And uh, uh, no way we were going to shut it down. But no one believed us. But we we went there. We we. We, we retained every management person. We ultimately re replaced the, the head guy because what we wanted to do there, he really, 
uh, he was he was in politics, and, and 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 we helped him get back in politics. But I mean, he, we needed somebody that knew forestry. I mean, uh, no, I mean we really did. We're still we're still good friends, and, and we need to be close with the with, with the legislature in New Mexico, and we are. But uh, we never we never lose employees. I mean, that's, that was a rare upgrade. And this guy we brought in, Marv Jensen. What was he running Yosemite at the time? He was running Yosemite. He was sixty three or four years old, maybe 65, he said, I'll come do it for three or four years. He's done it for more, and he's just announced his retirement, and that's when we did all the, uh, the, the, the move up the ladder at the turn of properties. But uh, that, they were doing 200 hunts then, and, and truthfully, there's about a, probably a, it's a multi-year wait to get on the list. So we price it, even though it sounds high, it doesn't, for, the, for what you get. I know what we spend to maintain that ranch, and trust me, you're getting a deal if, if you go. And we serve gourmet food. We have terrific chefs. It's, uh, it's uh, got a tremendous lodge. We probably house 40, 50 people at one time, maybe more. I'm not sure. Um, in our other properties, we, the, one of Ted's main properties is Flying D in Montana. We take hunters there. They repeat. I mean, we don't open many slots in a year. You, you, you sort of have to. <laughs> what's funny is we find if we get selling, we're selling a guy a hunt at Flying D. He's the same guy that wants to buy one at Vermejo and or the Bar None or one of the other ranches. And so, we don't sell as many fishing opportunities because fishing you can put a lot of pressure on the fish and you can put a lot of pressure on the wildlife. But when you got 600,000 acres, you have to manage. You have to take these herds down. And we have, uh, we have hunts for disabled, for children. Uh, and the disabled, and uh, and those are cow hunts where we have we're managing populations to get the maximum um, result out, out of the ecosystem. And uh, uh, some of our popular fishing destinations are as far away. Uh, we've got uh, a place on the Rio Grande and Terra del Fuego, Argentina, on the Chilean border, right at the Straits of Magellan. I mean, you're almost at Antarctica, and uh, that's some great fishing, and um, uh, there we have some availability because we haven't been doing it so long, and people don't know much about it. But um, um, not much. So I, uh, we'd like to do more, but we're not going to pressure the resource. And um, uh, again, if you, if you go to that Ted Turner website, it'll take you to ranching opportunities and uh, ranching hunting opportunities. And you know, I thought when Ted was married to Jane that we'd you know we'd set up something at Vermejo for fitness. I we didn't. Doesn't mean we won't, but we might. But, uh, you know, you've got excellent cross-country skiing. That ranch goes from four or 5,000 feet to 13,000 feet. I mean, it's out with Taos, New Mexico is where it is, right? It's, you know, we make a ski resort there, but we're not. And uh, uh, the opportunities are all listed on there, and get on the list would be my, my advice to you. Yeah. Anybody else? Going once, going to, well, one last one, and we'll call it. Yeah. You bet. You bet. We're already talking to Vinod Kosla, who's doing a mill uh, in South Georgia. I mean, we, we, we're not technology experts. We're going to have to rely on somebody like Vinod to, to help us. But you know what? He'll talk to us because we got all the land in New Mexico. You want to put a concentrated solar place? No better place. You want to put a photovoltaic solar? We're looking at proposing a huge one uh, in New Mexico at this moment. We're putting the proposal together. It ought to be ready by Friday. So. The Coastlers of this world, the Bransons, what we found with Ted is he's so genuine that when we put this, when we hired this consultant to come in and check the landscape, they called Vinod Coastler, they got to talk to Vinod Coastler. He didn't know whether we were going to be an investor, partner, or competitor. But they opened up everything. I mean, we're pretty honest. We, we, when we know, we tell you. But we don't know. I mean, we didn't know going in what we would do. And we were open to doing any and all of the above. And it wouldn't surprise me if we do a deal with Coastler. It wouldn't surprise me if we invest in his new company, Ultra, which is a concentrated solar company that he's uh, one, of, one of many that he's doing that'll, that'll attack switchgrass and other cellulosic uh, biofuels. Okay? Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you, bud. I don't want you to go too far. We've got a, uh, a special uh, piece of artwork glass. It's from Paul Bendezunas, an artist in Athens, and we want to give you that. That's Thank a, you. Something for your office.
Good. Appreciate your time this morning. I do want to okay. remind everybody that uh, parking is paid for, uh, so just mention to them that you were at Terry Third Thursday, and I hope we uh, see you next month for uh, 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 Steve Lamastro with uh, Raving Brands. And thank you for coming.